12.30 until 2.15 Eastern so senators can attend their weekly party lunches. This evening, senators will gather in the chamber before proceeding over to the House for President Obama's State of the Union address. Watch live coverage on C-SPAN beginning at 8 Eastern. Now live coverage on the Senate floor on C-SPAN 2. Let us pray. Eternal God, you are always right, just, and fair. We sing of your steadfast love and proclaim your faithfulness to all generations. Today, inspire our lawmakers to walk in the light of your countenance. Abide with them so that they will not be brought to grief, but will avoid the pitfalls that lead to ruin. Lord, empower them to glorify you in all they think, say, and do, as they remember that all they have and are is a gift from you. This is the day that you have made. We will rejoice and be glad in you, the source of our hope and joy. We pray in your holy name. Amen. Please join me in reciting the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. In the regard for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Mr. President? Majority Leader. Only my remarks and those of the Republican leader, the Senate will resume consideration of the motion to proceed to S-1926, the flood insurance bill, post-closure. The Senate will recess from 1230 until 215 today to allow for our weekly caucus meetings. Mr. President, I understand that S-1963 is the desk can do for a second reading. The clerk will read the title of the bill for the second time. S. 1963, a bill to repeal Section 403 of the Bipartisan Budget Act of 2013. Ms. Ms. President, could I ask who the sponsors of this legislation are? Who's sponsoring it? Uh, it's uh, sponsored by the Senators Pryor, Hagan, Shaheen, and Baggage. Thank you, Mr. President. I would object to any further proceedings with respect to this bill. The objection having been heard, the uh, bill will be placed on the calendar. Mr. President, I congratulate Diane Scavarla on her retirement after 20 years of service, dedicated service as a Senate curator. Every day, people from across the country, and we who work in this great building, uh, including our students on field trips, dignitary staffers, centers alike, appreciate the historic treasures displayed in the hallways of this capital. These works of fine art and craftsmanship are symbols of our democracy. And for two decades, Diane has been the steward of these treasures. I thank her for her dedication, and I wish her the very best in her future endeavors. And I'd ask consent that a more complete statement be made part of the record as, 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 as if given. Without objection. Mr. President, I'm gratified we were able to get enough votes to begin debate on the flood insurance bill. Senators Menendez and Landrieu worked closely with the Republican co-sponsors to get the bill this far. We have a long time. We've been trying to get this for a long, long time. We're very close to a consent agreement to move forward on the bill with a few relevant amendments. So we're going to move forward with a consent agreement or move forward with the bill. This bill is going to move forward this week. I hope that we can work something out today to move forward. Once again, I commend Senators Menendez, Landrieu, and Isaacson for their hard work.
Mr. President. The Republican leader. Tonight, members of both parties uh, will welcome the President to the Capitol as he lays out his plans uh, for the coming year. We look forward to hearing what he has to say. We also look forward to hearing what Congresswoman McMorris Rogers has to say, too. She's a leader in our party with a compelling story, someone who truly understands what it means to overcome adversity, someone who's dedicated to helping every single American realize her greatest potential. The people of Washington's 5th District are lucky to have her, and so are we. As for the President's speech, this is a pivotal moment in the Obama presidency. We're now entering our sixth year with President Obama at the helm of our economy, the sixth year of his economic policies. And at this point, we've seen just about everything in the President's toolbox. We've had a years-long clinic on the failures of liberalism, the government stimulus, the taxes, the regulations, the centralization, the government control. It just hasn't worked. Seventy-four percent of American people say it still feels like the country is in a recession, because to them, it still feels like it. As the majority leader likes to say, the rich have gotten richer and the poor have gotten poorer. And ladders into the middle class have been kicked away, sawed off, and literally regulated into oblivion. This is the legacy of the Obama economy as we stand here at the start of 2014. But it doesn't have to be the legacy President Obama leaves behind in January of 2017. And that's why tonight's address is so important. Because it will give us the clearest indication yet of whether the President is ready to embrace the future or whether he'll once again take the easy route, the sort of reflexive liberal route, and just pivot back to the failed policies of the past. The choice the President now confronts is a pretty basic one. Does he want to be a hero to the left or a champion for the middle class? Can't be both. He's got to choose. He could double down on the failed policies that brought us to this point. It would make his base pretty happy, I'm sure. But we certainly know where that path leads for the middle class. Folks can try to package it any way they like. Say it's a new focus on income stagnation that's gotten so much worse under this president's watch. But it's essentially the same path we've been on since he took office. The point is this. Americans do not need a new message. They need a new direction. They don't need a new message. They need a new direction. The problem isn't the packaging. It never has been. It's the policies themselves. And President Obama is the only person who can force that turn in direction. He's the only one who can lead it. He could reach to the center tonight and embrace change over the broken status quo, embrace hope over stale ideology, ideology that's led not just to stagnant incomes, but to lower median incomes, to dramatic increases in the number of folks forced to take part-time work when they want, really want full-time work, to greater long-term unemployment, to more poverty. He could ask members of both parties to help him make 2014 a year of real action, rather than just a talking point. If he does, he's going to find he has a lot of support from Republicans because we want to work with him to get things done, and we always have. We'll be listening closely to see if he's finally prepared to meet us in the political middle so we can finally get some important things done for the middle class. And let's be honest, there's a lot that can be done. For instance, he could call on Senate Democrats to stop blocking all the job creation bills the House of Representatives has already passed. He could call for revenue-neutral tax reform that would abolish loopholes, lower tax rates for everyone, 
and jumpstart job creation where it counts in the private sector. He could push his party to join Republicans supporting bipartisan trade promotion legislation, something the President has said is a priority, and work aggressively to clinch the kind of job creating trade agreements our allies in places like Canada and Europe and Australia have already been seeking. He could work with us to reduce the debt and deficit to ensure the programs Americans count on will be there when they retire, to make government smarter and leaner, to unshackle the growth, the growth potential of small businesses and entrepreneurs, to address the massive dissatisfaction out there with the size and the scope of government. And if President Obama wants to score an easy win for the middle class, he could simply put the politics aside and approve the Keystone Pipeline. <clears throat> the Keystone Pipeline is thousands of American jobs very soon. <clears throat> With regard to the Keystone Pipeline, he won't even need to use the phone, just the pen, one stroke, and the Keystone Pipeline is approved. I know the Keystone issue is difficult for him because it involves a choice between pleasing the left and helping the middle class. But that's exactly the type of decision he needs to make. He needs to make it now. It's emblematic of the larger choices he'll need to make about the direction of our country, too. Because for all of this talk going around Congress, he wouldn't have to if he'd actually try to work with the people's elected representatives every now and then. I'm saying don't talk about using the phone, just use the phone. And please be serious when you call. Take the income inequality issue we hear he'll address tonight. Is this going to be all rhetoric, or is he actually serious? Because he's correct to point out that the past few years have been very, very tough on the middle class. As I indicated, median household income has dropped by thousands since he took office. Republicans want to work with him on this issue, but only if he's serious about it. He could show us he is by calling for more choices for underprivileged children trapped in failing schools. Or he could agree to work with Senator Rand Paul and me to implement economic freedom zones in our poorest communities. And here's something else. He could work with us to relieve the pain Obamacare is causing for so many Americans across the country, across all income brackets. I asked him last year to prepare Americans for the consequences of this law. He didn't do it. Today, those consequences are plain for anyone to see. Just last night, I hosted a teletown hall meeting where Kentuckians shared their stories about the stress that Obamacare is causing them and their families. Restricted access to doctors and hospitals, lost jobs, lower wages, fewer choices, higher costs. I assure you, these folks won't be applauding when the President tries to spin this law as a success tonight more than a quarter million Kentuckians lost their plans that they had and presumably wanted to keep, despite the President's promises to the contrary. This is a law that caused premiums to increase an average of 47 percent in Kentucky, and in some cases, more than 100 percent. This is a law that, in some parts of my state, is limiting choices for health care coverage to just two companies, two companies in the individual exchange market. And at what cost to the taxpayer for all of this? $253 million. That's how much Washington has spent so far for these results in my state. A quarter of a billion dollars to essentially limit care, cancel plans, and increase costs. Kentucky's gotten more money to set up its exchange than every state except California. New York, Oregon, and Washington. That's a lot of money. And they still only enrolled 30 percent of the people they were supposed to at this point. How in the world could that be considered 
a success. So President Obama and Governor Bashir can keep telling Americans to get over it if they don't like this law, but sooner or later, they're going to have to come to terms with reality. They're going to have to accept that Obamacare just hasn't worked like the administration promised in Kentucky and across America, and it's time to start over with real reform. That's why tonight I hope the president will make a change. I hope he'll announce his willingness to work with members of both parties to start over with real bipartisan reform that can actually lower costs and improve quality of care. That's the kind of reform Kentuckians and Americans really want. And that's the way President Obama can show that he's serious about having a year of action. At this time next year, we'll be able to judge if he was. Because if the president's still talking about unemployment benefits next January rather than how to manage new growth, if he's still forced to address the pain of Obamacare rather than touting the benefits of bipartisan health reform, if we're still trapped in these endless cul-de-sacs of keystone and trade and tax reform, then we'll know, we'll know what choice the president made. We'll know that the special interests won, that the middle class lost, but I hope we won't get there. I hope he'll reach out tonight. I hope he'll be serious. I hope he'll help us chart a new path for the American people that both parties can support. That may sound like a fantasy to some on the hard left who think tonight's all about them. But the fact is, there have always been good ideas that two parties can agree on in Washington, ideas that would make life easier, not harder, for working Americans. Until now, the president's mostly chosen to ignore them. Here's hoping for something different tonight. <coughs> no, another matter. I'd like to just say a fond farewell to the Senate's longtime curator, uh, Diane Scovarla, who's been such a tremendous asset to the institution over the years and a very, great, a very good friend to our office as well. All of our dealings with Diane over the years have been marked by her great professionalism and her deep knowledge of and respect for the Senate and its history. Diane and her staff have been invaluable in the multi-year restoration of the Strom Thurmond Room and in keeping up the rest of our historic suite. My staff has always enjoyed working with Diane and her staff, and I hope we've been as gracious in return. Now, for a lot of young people who wring their hands or wander around for a while after college, Diane started working full-time in the Senate the Monday after she graduated and has been here off and on ever since. <clears throat> she witnessed a lot of changes in the curator's office over the years. When Diane started here full-time in 1979, there were only three staffers in the office, but in the years leading up to and after the nation's bicentennial, when preservation really came back into vogue, there was no shortage of new work. Diane went on to earn a master's degree in museum studies from George Washington in 1987. And it paid off when she helped put together a major exhibit for the Senate's own bicentennial in 1989. Diane collaborated on the exhibit with Don Ritchie, and together they set a new high standard for projects of this kind. At the time, Diane was associate curator and Don associate historian. They'd both rise through the ranks of their respective offices, so it's been a fruitful collaboration for many years. Diane spent most of her early childhood in England, where she first learned the sport of dressage. She gave up horses during college at Colgate in upstate New York, but went back to England in 1991 to become certified in teaching the sport. She kept up her riding after she returned to the States and came back to the Senate as head curator 
in late 1994, replacing the widely admired Jim Ketchum. With Jim's support and encouragement, Diane learned the ropes and has doggedly pursued the legislative mandate of the Senate Curator's Office ever since. And that mandate is to protect, preserve, and educate. <clears throat> Some of the biggest challenges Diane has faced have involved dealing with disasters. In 1983, a bomb planted near the Senate chamber destroyed portions of the corridor, including a portrait of Daniel Webster. Under Diane's supervision, a conservator put the pieces back together, put it back together and restored it. Other projects Diane has been particularly proud of over the years include the publication of the United States Senate Catalog of Fine Art, a 481-page book that took years to complete, and the restoration of a giant portrait of Henry Clay from my state that was given to the Senate after being discovered in the basement of a historical society. This magnificent painting of clay now hangs in the stairway off the Bermidi Corridor. The restoration of the old Senate chamber was also a proud achievement. The entire Senate family is grateful to Diane for her many years of devoted service to this institution. Through her work, <clears throat> through her work she has helped preserve and bring to life the shared objects of our collective history as a people, precious objects that belong to all Americans and to our posterity. Her legacy is literally all around us. We thank her for her work and wish her and her husband, Chris, all the very best in the years ahead. Under the previous order, the leadership time is reserved. Under the previous order, the Senate will resume consideration of the motion to proceed to S-1926, which the clerk will report. Motion to proceed to the consideration of calendar number 294 S-1926, a bill to delay the implementation of certain provisions of the Bigert Waters Flood Insurance Reform Act of 2012 and for other purposes. Mr. President. The Senator from Louisiana. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I'd like to speak for up to 10 minutes. I think we're in morning business. The Senate is, is moving to proceed to consider motion S. Okay. 1926. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, I'm going to speak then on the bill uh, that's before us, and I really appreciate the cooperation of so many members. Uh, last night that voted to move forward on the debate of the fix to bigger waters. We had a very strong, very impressive vote. I think 83 members, uh, Republicans and Democrats came together from all parts of the country, uh, from all different um, uh, areas and districts and backgrounds to vote to move forward on the debate on flood insurance. And I'm really grateful. Uh, we've been working on this for about a year and a half. Uh, it's been a tough slog uh, because two years ago, a bill called Bigger Waters would, was passed, named after their two co-sponsors in the House, Congresswoman Biggert and Congresswoman Waters, who passed a bill with very good intentions, thinking that they were going to strengthen the flood insurance program. The bill had wonderful intentions, but unfortunately, the way it was finally drafted in the conference committee, it's had disastrous results. And some of us knew that two years ago and started working literally the moment the bill, the conference bill was passed to begin changing it. And so we have worked diligently and together and built a great coalition. I really want to thank the 200 organizations that came quickly together over the last year and a half as quickly as any of these things can really happen in a practical sense, to really understand what went wrong in the first bill, how we could fix it so we could accomplish two really important goals for the National Flood Insurance Program. One, that the program could be self-sustaining, in other words, pay for itself with limited or minimal taxpayer um, burden. 
But the other equally important goal, and you know, Mr. President, representing New Jersey, how important this is, just like I understand this from Louisiana, the other equally important goal was that the program could be affordable to middle class families. Because if it's not affordable to middle class families, they won't participate in it, and the program will go bankrupt for lack of participation. In insurance, the idea is to have a large pool to spread the risk, and that's how an insurance system works. Well, what Bigger Waters did, and if we don't fix it, is going to make that pool get smaller and smaller and smaller because people will not be able to afford it. The program will collapse, and the taxpayers will be saddled with debt. So the goal of our coalition, which is led by uh, Menendez, Senator Menendez, your senior senator from New Jersey who's on the banking committee, who's been one of the great spokesmen for this and leaders, Senator Isaacson from Georgia, who is literally the most respected member in this whole body on issues related to real estate because he has one of the largest or had one of the largest real estate companies in Atlanta, knows the issue well, is very respected on both sides of the aisle. These two gentlemen have led this effort and have built a bipartisan coalition. So we are now ready this week, of all weeks, it's a State of the Union week, we would have probably preferred another one, but it's just the way this worked, um, to debate the uh, bill on the floor of the Senate. At last count, when we left, there were about six or seven relevant amendments, which is the only amendments that we're going to accept, relevant amendments to this bill. We're not going to accept amendments that are on other subjects in an effort to derail the Senate, get us off topic, et cetera, et cetera. We will accept only relevant amendments to this bill. And the happy thing is, we think we only have about seven or eight. Some amendments are Republican, some amendments are Democratic. Now, we just received an amendment from one of the opponents of our bill, uh, the good senator from Pennsylvania, who has not been supportive of our bill, uh, who has not worked with the coalition, who has not cooperated in any way. He's filed an amendment just, we got it an hour ago. We've been actually waiting for a year and a half. Um, last May, he opposed the bill, and we couldn't even get to the debate because he wasn't happy in the direction that we're going in. So that happened in May. It's now, what is this month? Um, January. <laughs> We're in January. So he opposed the bill in May. It set us back seven months. We tried to explain to the senator from Pennsylvania that 74,000 people in his state have these policies and that they too need help. Whether he's been able to reconcile that with his uh, constituents, I don't know. But we literally after asking and asking and asking for his comments, his thoughts, his input. Please let us know what we can do. We'll be happy to meet with you. The home builders will sit down, the realtors. We finally, at the last hour, get a draft of his amendment in the last hour. So we're literally reading it for the first time. I don't think that's cooperation, but he may have a different definition of it. So we're reading that amendment now. I don't believe this amendment is going to help our cause. I think it's going to undermine what we're trying to do. I will have you know, more comments about the specifics of it. Um, but the senator from Pennsylvania, for whatever reason, has just not been cooperative the whole time. We'll be happy to vote on his amendment. I think the amendment is going to do great harm to the bill. And I think I would urge our coalition at this point to vote no. But I'm going to go look at it. Senator Isaacson has just received a copy of it uh, in the last hour. And all I can do is ask our colleagues to be patient while we review this 13-page uh, amendment. We're trying to get, you know, we have 200 organizations that have been working on this. We're trying to, you know, be fair and get their input, and then we will know how to proceed. But the bottom line is this. This week, we are going to pass a flood insurance relief bill off the floor of the United States Senate. And I want to put everybody here on notice that we have run out of patience. 
We have been working on this for a year and a half. We were told before Christmas we could have a vote. Then we were told we could have a vote when we got back. Then we were told we could have a vote before you know, we left. This is it. There's no more time. We're voting on this this week. We're either going to do it the easy way or the hard way. We're either going to have a few amendments that the Republicans put up, the Democrats put up, and we get back to legislating like we should, or the leader is going to file cloture on this bill and we are going to pass it without an amendment. And if one single Republican comes to this floor and says that they did not have time to discuss their amendment, we will debate until the cows come home because I am not leaving this floor until every single person in America knows the games that could be played up here. Now, I have been more than transparent. I have been more than honest. I have come here more than any senator. And I don't know if this is good or bad. It's just the only way I know how to lead is to be forthright and honest with myself, with my constituents, and with people that really need to know what in the heck is going on up there. I just don't know how else to do it. And I'm not going to apologize. I'm not going to go read about how to do this in a book. There are no books on this. This is about leadership from the inside. And the only people that taught me this were my parents. So I'm just saying, if anyone in this chamber thinks they're going to get away with trying to give some flimsy, limsy excuse about how they didn't get their amendment considered, how they're upset with the leader, they will have to go through me, and I'm not moving. Because I've got people all over this country that are desperate. We passed the wrong bill. We should not have passed it. We must fix it. And we are going to fix it this week in the United States Senate. Now, what the House does, what Speaker Boehner does, he made some negative comments about the bill last week. My comments back where the Speaker has his hands full. He's been busy. I understand it. You know, I wouldn't want his job. He's got a tough job. He's got a lot of issues to juggle. But I said, and I will say again, when this bill comes to the House, which it will when it passes the Senate this week, he will hear from millions and millions of Americans that paid their mortgage every month, that went to work every day, who honor their family by building homes in places they've been for generations, and they're about ready to take those front door keys and turn them in to the local bank and walk away from their house. And Speaker Boehner is going to hear that. And I hope that they will, those words, those expressions, those pictures, those letters will hit his heart the way they have hit mine, and that he will have a softened heart and an open mind and he will consider what we're trying to do. And I realize that our way may not be the most perfect way, but it's a good way, and if somebody wants to improve it, fine. But don't scuttle it pretending that you're helping. Don't scuttle it by pretending that you're for some kind of you know, better approach. If there was a better approach, we would have found it in the last year and a half we've been searching. You're not going to find it in the last three minutes of this debate. So we're reviewing the Toomey Amendment. He has been the lead opponent of our effort. I don't believe his amendment is helpful, but until I read it, I won't be able to give a definitive. Senator Isaacson will have to give his views on it. Senator Menendez will have to give his views on it, and we'll figure it out. But we are going to bring relief to the five million people that have done nothing wrong, middle-class families, many of them, some of them very poor families that have been living in places for generations. And because FEMA can't get its flood maps right, because FEMA can't get the affordability study done, they're going to be kicked out of their homes. Talk about, you know, misguided regulation. And I hope that uh, Mitch McConnell, our leader, Republican leader, talking about misguided regulation, would 
put a little muscle here into helping us, and he's been, been cooperative, and I thank him. Senator Reid has been putting a lot of muscle into this, and I thank him. But, you know, I hope people will come to the floor and speak about the importance of this bill. We'll figure out this amendment process, all germane amendments, um, and get this final vote this week. But, you know, this is going to get done this week, you know, the easy way or the hard way. And we're done. And uh, the vote's going to happen this week. And we're going to move this bill to the floor. And to the president who put out a statement and his administration that they, you know, didn't have many positive things to say about this, um, let me just say I think their statement is they're misinformed. It was misguided. I'm really hoping the White House will reconsider the president's coming here tonight to talk about the importance of um, strengthening the middle class. I would think that allowing middle class people to stay in their homes would be a good place to start. So I hope that the administration will take a second look at this and uh, join us and help us um, to let middle class families stay in their homes. I mean, Colorado is a beautiful state. Let me just conclude. I've been there many times, but not everybody can live in the mountains of Colorado. There's some of us that have to live along rivers and streams and ports, you know, to build and to support the infrastructure that helps to make this country grow. And my people who fish every day, who harvest the oysters, who put seafoods on the table, who, you know, bring those huge and magnificent barges up and down the river, they can't live in Vail, Colorado. I'm sorry. They don't like the snow, and they couldn't afford to live there anyway. They live in little places like Buras and Venice and Plaquemine, and in the Lower Ninth Ward that got flooded out, every single home destroyed. They can go back if we use our science, our engineering, our brain, and lead with our hearts and our heads. This can work. But if people are playing political games, if they're trying to score political points, or if they're not working hard enough to understand the issue, then I feel sorry for them because the public needs our help. And I yield the floor. This of a quorum. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Alexander.
Senate's working on the flood insurance bill. This measure will delay raise increases for four years. The State of the Union address takes place tonight. Our coverage begins at 8 Eastern on our companion network C-SPAN. President Obama will start his speech at 9 p.m. We're going to show you a Republican member of Congress now for a look at what's ahead for tonight's speech. Yes, now Representative Jason Chaffetz, the Republican from Utah, a member of the Oversight and Government Reform Subcommittee on National Security, he serves as the chairman. Also, he is a member of the Judiciary and Homeland Sub Security Committees as a member. Thanks for joining us. Oh, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Talking about State of the Union, I asked the previous guest about how he thinks the president will address House Republicans tonight. How does he think, how do you think he's going to address you? Well, you know, this is going to be this, very gingerly. <laughs> um, this is the sixth time we will have heard from the president. Um, it's always good to hear from the president. Uh, I'm not one of those that's, uh, you know, trying to shun the president, but at the same time, He's sending very mixed signals. On the one hand, he's saying he wants to work with us. Inevitably, he'll say at some point, I'll work with anybody. But at the same time, he says, and if, but if you don't do it my way, I'm just going to go on my own. And so it's, it's a little offensive time after time to hear him say, we're just going to ignore you, Congress, as he's doing with the, uh, the action that he took this morning. And I, I just, uh, it's a very mixed message. So what do you think about that second approach of executive action as a, as a way of getting a policy done? I, I don't like it. Uh, I don't think that's the spirit of the Constitution. Uh, I, no one thing is supposed to be easy. The Constitution is set up so there is purposeful debate. And, and yet when the president says, oh, look, it's my way or the highway, I'm just going to go it alone, that's not very conducive to actually getting things done in this country. Make the case that you've worked with the president on issues then. Well, I, if I introduced a bill that when Senator Obama was, the pres was a senator, he introduced a bill that said, you know what, if you haven't paid your federal taxes, then you should be prohibited from getting uh, a federal contract. I agree with the president on this. I sponsored it. It passed the House unanimously. It sits over in the Senate. It passed in the 112th Congress. It's now passed in the 113th Congress. Why the president won't lift even one finger for a bill that he sponsored as a senator, I'm sponsoring as a pretty right-wing conservative Republican. I can look the president and everybody in the eye and say, I'm doing things that I know I agree with the president on, yet I get no help from the White House. As far as issues when it comes to income issues and equality issues, mm -hmm. What do you expect? To, uh, there's been telegraphed themes as far as that's concerned, but yeah. what do you expect specifically to hear from the president on these topics? Well, he, he wants to simply raise the minimum wage. He's trying to do that with federal contractors. I think he wants to see that across the board. I would look to the state of Utah. We have one of the lowest unemployment rates in the nation, a 4.1%. We have a thriving economy. We have uh, lower taxes. We have a great environment for business. We've got a beautiful place to live. Look to states that are actually making this happen, that haven't had the major economic downturn that other parts of the nation have. Maybe we should learn from a state like Utah as opposed to, hey, look, we're just going to do these, these things that we've been doing for decades and haven't worked, by the way. What lessons could the president learn from states? Well, we've got to have a fiscally responsible uh, uh, situation in our legislature. For instance, we uh, in the state of Utah, our state legislature, did some of the heavy lifting and, and, and talked about the retirement programs and went to, to find uh, contribution as, a, to, as opposed to to find benefit plan. Doesn't sound real sexy, doesn't make a lot of headlines, but makes a huge financial difference in the state. Consequently, we can keep our tax rates low. There are things like that that are very important. A regulatory environment that's predictable. Right now, one of the things I don't think that the White House uh, understands is that when you keep talking about all these changes in the regulatory environment, it creates uncertainty. Well, capital is resistant to making investment where there's uncertainty. And that uncertainty leads to a lot of hesitation and consequently, people don't invest as much in their jobs. When he keeps talking about all this health care mess that we have with Obamacare, when he talks about raising the cost of wages and minimum wage, when he talks about the increasing uh, regulatory environment on energy production, as a business, they're hesitant to make an investment. So back to minimum wage, where do you stand on raising it? Oh, I, I, I totally disagree with that. One of the things, one of the subsets here that doesn't get enough attention are students and youth. When you talk about raising the minimum wage, you are in essence saying we're going to hire less young people in this nation because if you own a, a little sub, you know, selling Subway sandwiches or you own some, a movie theater or whatever it is and then you talk about, well, let's raise the minimum wage, guess what? When you increase the cost of labor, you're going to have less people that you can ultimately hire along the way. And I worry that those 15, 16, 17, 18-year-olds are really ones that take the brunt of this 
uh, pain here. I understand that somebody's trying to make a career on minimum wage. Hey, let's get them trained up so they can get a better job along the way as opposed to, well, we're just going to artificially raise the cost of, of labor. Our guest with us until 9:15, Representative Jason Chaffetz of Utah. You can ask him questions on the phone lines, 202-585-3880. It's 585-3881 for Republicans, 585-3882 for Independents. Twitter and uh, email at your disposal as well. Our guest mentioned students. Besides uh, those of you watching today, also joining us, students from Texas Tech University, part of our C-SPAN uh, bus as it continues its Big 12 conference, and will be joining us throughout the course of the morning via Skype to ask questions of our guests. But our first call this morning is John, Louisville, Kentucky, Democrats line for Representative Jason Chaffetz. Good morning. Good morning to both of you. Um, I've always been an optimist, but I'll tell you, I've got a lot of friends, Republicans and Democrats, and good people, they vote. And, and basically, most people I know have come to the conclusion that between the... The senator from Oregon. Thank you, Mr. President. I rise to address the Homeowners Flood Insurance Affordability Act. Excuse me, um, the Senate is in quorum call. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask the quorum call be lifted. Without objection. Thank you. Uh, Mr. President, I've, I've come to the floor to talk about the Homeowners Flood Insurance Affordability Act. This bill is a bill that is designed to fix the damage that has been done by the Bigger Waters Act. And this damage is extensive. Uh, this bill would freeze dramatic rate hikes, and these rate hikes have several impacts. We have, of course, the impact on families that currently have flood insurance that will be paying much higher levels than they bargained for when they bought their home and may not be able to afford those much higher levels. Uh, raising questions about their ability to stay in those homes. We have the impact on commercial enterprises and the fact that now that they are paying higher rates, they may not feel that they can add on to their business in that location. And then we have the impact, of course, on selling your property, whether you are a homeowner or you are a business, because the folks who might be buying might have to jump to a full rate that would be many times, in some cases, 10 times the price that the current owner is paying. And when that happens, the property becomes unaffordable. And therefore, the value that one has in their home or business drops dramatically. So all of this is of great concern. And we need to reverse the features of bigger waters that are causing uh, this economic havoc. Now, this bill uh, comes out of discussions that were in my subcommittee on economic policy several months ago, and there, this discussion is now led uh, by Senator Menendez, uh, and he has been ably assisted and, and partnered with, with Senator Mary Landrieu and Senator Isaacson and Senator Vitter, and I compliment them all for being vocal advocates and instrumental in helping to move this bill forward. The Bigger Waters Act, while well-intentioned, is creating massive burdens for our middle-class homeowners in Oregon and certainly across the nation. Flooding is something of an equal opportunity disaster. For some, it's coastlines. For others, it's broad floodplains along major rivers. For others, it's narrow valleys and flash floods. But in all of these situations, the common impact is dramatic devastation. Something is very wrong, though, when families are more worried about dramatic spikes in their flood insurance premiums than they are worried about dramatic floods. And that's where my Oregon families are right now. I want to share a letter from Kelly. She lives in Taggart. And she says in her own words, quote, she is a middle-class single mother currently working to get her daughter through college. She bought her home 13 years ago to provide stability for her daughter. And this is a goal of so many parents, to have a piece of the American dream, to have the stability that goes home with home ownership, to have the equity that you build up in your home as a financial reservoir with which to assist your children going forward in life. 
She thought about selling a few years ago, but decided to stay in that house and keep that financial foundation. But now, with Bigger Waters going into effect, she's been caught between two bad choices. If she stays in her home, her flood insurance rates will go up precipitously, making her home increasingly unaffordable and squeezing an already tight budget. But should she try to sell, the new owner will face annual flood insurance premiums of $15,000 or more, making her home completely unaffordable for middle class buyers. Now keep in mind this, for every $1,000 that a buyer pays in flood insurance per year, the value of a home drops by about $20,000. So if the flood insurance is $15,000, you're talking about a value of a home dropping $300,000. And many middle-class homes in Oregon, they aren't priced at $300,000. They might be $200,000 or $220,000 or $250,000. Or in more rural areas, $150,000 or $175,000. So you can wipe out the complete value of a home and certainly easily wipe out the equity that a homeowner has built up over a number of years. So essentially you have to give the home away. That makes no sense. To read from Kelly's letter, quote, she says, here is where I see a problem. There is an old saying, you can't get blood from a stone. I know, she continues, I am not alone in my predicament of barely getting by financially. Middle income folks like me are squeezed from all sides. While living expenses rise every year, our income generally does not raise enough to make up for it. We tighten our belts. We wait for better times. So the problem here is we can't afford to pay these much higher rates. We just don't have the money. She continues in her analysis. She says, there are options, of course. We can come up with the many tens of thousands of dollars to raise our houses up and make them flood friendly. But wait, we don't have tens of thousands of dollars. And we can't sell. That's the beauty here. Who will buy a small middle income type home that has a flood insurance bill of fifteen to thirty thousand dollars a year? So she goes up forth. So what will we do, the over one million homeowners in this situation? To our utter frustration and humiliation, many of us have no choice but to walk away. Whatever the attitudes about us are, most of us are good Americans who believe in paying our debts. We have worked hard our entire lives and asked for little and no help along the way. This will crush us, and since we don't have the money to give, there is no benefit to be had. That's how she concludes her letter. This will crush us. And she's right. It will crush her family. It will crush millions of families across this country. It will include foreclosures. It will include equity wiped out. It will result in families having to walk away from their home and hope they aren't pursued by the mortgage company that will be unable to sell the home on a secondary market for the debt owed and therefore could pursue the owners. Mr. President, it is wrong and counterproductive to squeeze middle class homeowners like Kelly when it will only result in more foreclosures or families trapped in their homes unable to sell. Making flood insurance more solvent is a laudable goal, but it's one we have to approach in a manner that involves fairness over time. Achieving solvency by putting a huge burden, a huge financial shock on the backs of our middle class families isn't just wrong, it's a financial disaster that is unfolding now and will continue to unfold across this country. You can't get to solvency by asking families to pay sums they simply don't have. Or as Kelly said, you can't get blood from a stone. We need to immediately stop these dramatic rate hikes for our homeowners and for our businesses while FEMA goes back to the drawing board to figure out how to make this program affordable and effective for our middle class families. That is exactly what this bill does. 
This bill has several important provisions that help ensure affordability and fairness for our middle class families. The first is it delays implementation of flood insurance rate increases. It does so on primary residences and on businesses until FEMA can complete an affordability study, propose regulations to address the problem of affordability, and give Congress time to weigh in. Second, unlike Bigger Waters, this bill ensures that FEMA will truly have the funding they need to complete a comprehensive affordability study. Third, this bill takes on a catch-22 in the current system, which is that when homeowners face unaffordable rates that they think are inaccurate, they have to pay out of their pocket for a flood map appeal to prove that their premiums should be lower. So when someone else makes a mistake, they have to pay for that mistake, and that is wrong. The studies necessary for an appeal can cost between $500 and $2,000. It's a prohibitive cost for many families to undertake. This bill ensures that any homeowner who can successfully appeal a flood map finding will be reimbursed by FEMA for their expense, making the system fairer for the homeowner and giving FEMA an added incentive to get it right. Finally, this bill does something very important in creating a flood insurance rate map advocate within FEMA, someone to educate and advocate for homeowners. One of the complaints my office has heard is that FEMA has not been responsive to homeowners' concerns or questions about changes in their policy. The creation of this position, an advocate, will do several things. It the advocate will educate policyholders about their flood risks and their options in choosing a policy. The advocate will assist those who believe their flood map is wrong and assist them through the appeals process. The advocate will improve outreach and coordination with local officials, community leaders, and Congress. My colleagues, Senator Hoven and Senator Heitkamp, have also done great work on this bill to ensure that homeowners in certain communities are not hit by unfair rules on how their basements impact a flood policy. I want to address one other issue that is not in this bill that hopefully I will be able to offer an amendment on, and that is protection for consumers whose policies are purchased by their mortgage servicer or their bank rather than by themselves. This is the issue of predatory forced placed premiums. Let me explain. Let's say, for example, that you are notified by your servicer that they have reviewed the records and they now consider you to be in a floodplain they hadn't noticed before and you have to get it flood insurance. But that flood insurance, unsubsidized, is so expensive you can't afford it. So then the servicer says, well, we're going to put on flood insurance for you and the rate might be five to ten times the market rate. In other words, the homeowner who already can't afford flood insurance is gouged by a predatory premiums on forced place insurance. Or let's consider that perhaps you have a transition in your family. Maybe you had one partner paying the bills and another partner takes it over while the first partner is sick and you miss the fact that your annual premium was due on your flood insurance. So what happens? That lapse can trigger much higher rates that you can't afford. And then suddenly you're in the situation of forced place insurance. Or how about if new maps are issued? And the new maps now put you into a 100-year flood plain that you weren't in previously. It isn't that the geography changed, it's that a different set of engineers doing a different study and different assumptions about whether the rain will fall and which creek will swell the quickest puts you into this 100-year floodplain. So now what are you going to do? You're going to be in this situation and you can't afford that insurance, that newly placed requirement for insurance. And so the servicer or bank puts it on for you. Well, they should put it on at a fair market rate, not at a rate that is five to ten times the fair market rate that is designed to gouge. And so I have an amendment that addresses this by saying that the service or the bank cannot take fees, or as some would say, kickbacks, cannot take fees by, for placing this insurance and therefore have an incentive 
to do a non-market rate policy that is five or ten times higher than the actual market rate. This is a significant problem in forced place home insurance and certainly we don't need to add to this problem by allowing predatory premiums on forced place policies in the realm of flood insurance. So I encourage my colleagues on both sides of the aisle to take a look at this issue, to support banning the anti-competitive features of the market that have led to these predatory premiums on flood, place, on, on flood insurance, forced place flood insurance. In closing, I want to again thank my colleagues who have worked so hard on this. This is an important issue, an incredibly important issue for families across Oregon. Let's stop these dramatic height, rate hikes. Let's work together for an affordable flood insurance program that will be effective and fair for all Americans. Thank you, Mr. President, and I yield the floor. Senator from Iowa. I would ask to speak in morning business for about 20 minutes. Without objection. Yeah. And I also ask permission at the end of my remarks to insert some letters.